thanks Caroline, thanks Joe once <coughs> again for uh, the invitation uh, to speak here. It has become, is that okay? Okay, bit of system corruption there. It has become one of the cliches of modern Irish political discourse to say that our political system uh, is, is broken. As a journalist, and uh, therefore I like to think something of an expert in cliches, I think this is one of the better ones. Uh, to say our system is broken, or our political system is, is broken, is, is short. It sounds quite portentous, and it can mean whatever we wanted it to mean. It was used by all the political parties in last year's general election to justify all manner of tomfoolery and rhetoric. The, the present coalition parties in particular promised a new politics with a capital N and P. New politics. This would be different from the old politics. It would be better and it would be newer and it would be shinier. Uh, it turns out that the new politics isn't all that different from the old politics and the reason is, or one of the reasons is that that New politics is run by the old politicians. It's better in many ways, certainly. But in its essence, I think, it's still suffering from the same defects as the old politics. Incidentally, I was surprised to hear in one of the contributions uh, this morning that I was part of a sort of an axis of conservatism with Stephen Collins and, uh, and, uh, and Pat Kenny having never suggested that our system was broken. It's, uh, it, it comes as a shock, of course, to find that your uh, outpourings are not as closely studied as you might hope. But anyway, um, I was less surprised uh, to hear Elaine Byrne say that uh, my book had only sold a fraction of what Fifty Shades of Grey had uh, sold, and I undertook quietly at the back to have a lot more sex in my next book. Um, <laughs> about politics, <laughs> though, uh, though I've said that, I was about 50 shades of blue getting out of the sea this morning in Port New, but however. Um, what I hope to do in the course of this uh, contribution is to identify some of the principal ways in which I think our system is broken, uh, to outline how that has led the country, I think, to its, its current state, and to suggest ways in which we might begin to change this. I'll argue that we may satisfy ourselves that we are changing corrupt practices. I don't believe that we're re really changing the essence of a system, important parts of which have become corrupted. The title of the current session asks us to consider the lessons and the implications of political corruption in Ireland. And for perhaps obvious reasons, we're inclined to think of political corruption in terms of brown envelopes or of envelopes being passed from developer to councillor in pursuit of, of rezonings in this, in a transaction that will enrich both parties. And the report, as you'll know, the report of the Mahan Tribunal found that this sort of corruption was endemic in parts of our political system, as much of a feature of local democracy as holding clinics and attending funerals. I think it's reasonable to assume that if the local government of other areas of the country was subjected to the scrutiny that Dublin experienced, that many more revelations of precisely the same sort of classic corruption would ensue. And this realization that we've been living in a country where at least parts of our local government system have been endemically, profoundly corrupt is something I think that we've kind of chosen not really to think about. And nor was this straightforward, plain vanilla corruption limited to local government. The Mahan Tribunal found that parts of national government were also willing to place themselves for sale as were their counterparts in local government. And the response of the political system to this picture of systemic corruption in Flood and Moriarty uh, may seem underwhelming. The response to Moriarty was in the Dáil, there was a, a motion condemning Michael Lowry, and uh, Fine Gael have tried to avoid mentioning Dennis O'Brien, and also to act as if you're not trying to avoid mentioning uh, Dennis O'Brien. 
And if someone mentions Dennis O'Brien, most uh, many senior Fine Gaelers seem to respond by developing a sudden, sudden interest in, in their shoes. Labour, on the other hand, mentions Dennis O'Brien when it wants to embarrass Fine Gael. This could come in quite handy, I think, um, uh, in private coalition discussions, but as a substantive response to the tribunals, it's not really satisfactory. But there has actually been, I think, a more substantial response in the shape of new corruption legislation, the draft scheme of which has been published uh, by the Minister for Justice. Now, it rem remains, of course, uh, to be seen if this will be enacted as is currently planned. But as currently drafted, or as currently indicated, I think it has the potential to completely change the legal landscape that deals with, uh, that deals with corruption. Along with the legislation on lobbying and whistleblowing and political donations, I think it's probably fair to say at this stage that the government is attempting to transform the legal architecture that governs the murky places that business and politics sometimes interact in. I think the government needs to take two further steps. I think it should introduce total transparency in political funding. I think the existing legal infrastructure in which donations above a certain limit are, uh, are disclosed has served to give the appearance of rigid control, but in actual fact has been pliable to the continuation of private money influencing politics and policy. I think if you had a situation where all monies, no matter how small the sum, that were paid to, spent by, and collected by political parties and politicians were disclosed and publicly audited, I think it would go a long way to eliminating the influence that money can sometimes have in politics. The second thing I think the government should do uh, would be to establish a dedicated agency to police compliance with campaign finance laws. Neither, as Noel has said, neither the criminal justice system nor I think the kind of clubby self-governance of politicians has proved to be remotely equipped for this task. I think if politicians wanted to affect real change in the way this particular part of their business is done, they would give powers, resources, teeth and independence to the Standards and Public Office Commission or to a similar dedicated agency with a mandate to inquire and to, uh, and to prosecute. Would the public notice this? Probably not, at least initially. In general, the public suspects that most politicians are up to no good. And, in fact, somebody, again, I think referred to it this morning, that this heightened awareness of the envelope-type corruption among the Irish electorate is so acute that the bare mention of the word envelope by one presidential candidate during the televised debate in last October's election was enough to have the audience hooting their derision and begin this massive national change of mind. I mean, we'll never know, I suppose, uh, for definite, if Sean Gallagher, instead of what he said, instead of mentioning an envelope, had said, the man may have given me a paper bag with a check in it. Or the man may have given me a strangely folded and gummed sheet of paper into which we could insert other pieces of paper. Or he may have given me an antique vase with a check in it for Fianna Fáil. Perhaps now he'd be thinking his positive thoughts and practicing his judo moves on the lawns of the Oris and Uchtaran. We don't know, but we know that mentioning an envelope turned out to be a very bad idea. The measures I outlined earlier, I think, would quite effectively combat, I would certainly more effectively combat this kind of plain vanilla envelope type corruption that most of us understand by the term political corruption. But, and this is what I really want to talk about, corruption isn't just about envelopes. I think a system can become corrupted or broken without anybody passing envelopes to anybody else. And I think that's part of what has happened to our politics and to our government. Parts of our system are simply broken. They're corrupted. I think there's three different types of this non-envelope corruption evident in the Irish system. There's a sort of systematic corruption in which the system of government and administration and those who operate it ensure that the preservation of that system 
and of the part that they and people like them play in it. This doesn't feel like corruption, but it is a characteristic of a system which is corrupted or broken or unable to adequately perform its ostensible task because it is devoted to its own processes rather than to the goals of the greater public good. I listened to one minister recently defend legislative proposals he had inherit, inherited on the basis that there was 70 years of experience in the area in his department and it should be listened to. This might have held more water had the expertise in question not been promoting the Irish language, not, I think, the most outstanding example of policy success in the history of Irish governance. Another minister told me how he was introduced last year to his new department by the Secretary General who gave him the tour and told him, now, Minister, all these people work for you. What would you like them to do? There's nothing civil servants like more than to hear their minister saying, my department. Notice how quickly ministers in the new government took to using the phrase, my department, as it was in the beginning and ever shall be world without end. Amen. At the heart of this worldview is a profound conservatism, which is probably not atypical of any large and self-perpetuating clerisy, but it does not serve the public interest. I think the Crow Park Agreement is maybe the starkest statement of this dogged defensiveness of the system, this deep-rooted conservatism. Crow Park has certainly delivered industrial peace while the government achieved savings, relatively modest savings now, on the public sector pay bill. And that, in the achievement of that industrial piece shouldn't be discounted. But I think the design of the agreement is dedicated to preserving the public service we know rather than really reforming it. There's no serious in attempt to introduce structures which would enable management to differentiate on the grounds of performance Meaningful measurement of performance is as far away as ever. Employees will still be paid for getting older rather than better at their jobs. And the, pre prevention, or the preservation of pension benefits for those near retirement is much more important than defending new and younger workers. The absolute untouchability of retirement lump sums at a time when the starting wage in the public service has been cut by 10% and allowances, increments and overtime, all of which are more important to younger workers are now on the block, tells the real story of Crow Park and of the priorities of the union chiefs who negotiated it with other senior officials. Now this may not be corruption as we generally understand it, but it is evidence of a system that has evolved to benefit certain groups and a system whose original aims have been corrupted. The second type of non-envelope corruption that I submit characterises the Irish system is a hyper-electoralism in which the democratic choices are reduced to a transaction between politician and voter, in which votes are delivered to the politician in return for either personal or community-wide favours. I pointed out here before that voters are just as much to blame, in fact maybe more so to blame than politicians for this but I think it still amounts to the same corrupted system. Insofar as there was a political philosophy rather than just a, a functioning model of politics behind Bertie Ahern's years of success, this was it. Keep people happy by giving them things and they will vote for you at election time. And this was pretty successful. But it also contained within itself the seeds of its own downfall. Promises got bigger and the voters' demands became ever more expensive. Labour and Fine Gael, observing the success of the Ahern Ahern model sought to compete in the promising stakes. Now, of course, politicians everywhere promise voters that they will deliver them all manner of goodies. But I think the Irish experience is unusual in the extent to which it completely dominates politics and politicians' lives. And I think it is sufficiently significant as to distort and corrupt our system. I'll give you one example to illustrate it. Um, our paper, The Business Post, pub publishes every week a short kind of question and answer feature with ordinary backbenchers. And one of the things we ask them to do, uh, we ask them uh, to answer is, what is the worst thing the voters have ever asked you to do? The responses offer a glimpse into the demands that voters make of politicians. Here's a few of the things 
that politicians were asked to do by voters in return to a vote. Mow the lawn, babysit while the voters went to the polling station, pet a dog which had just bitten the candidate, <laughs> model swimwear, feed a pet lizard while the owner went on holiday, fix the television, take part in a yoga session in the voters' front room, assess whether a buried Ford Cortina would suffice as a septic tank, <laughs> and marry the voters' daughter. Uh, except that the last one may have been facetious, so the TD, uh, the TD seemed at least interested in an initial inspection of the... But I think what this demonstrates is when a politician calls to the door for very many voters, they see this as an opportunity for some sort of personal or community gain. What is being discussed is a simple transaction. A lot of TDs have internalized this transaction. One TD has taken it a step further and made a down payment on future votes. The Fine Gael TD for Kerry South, Brendan Griffin, has donated half his salary to a local school to enable it to retain a teacher. Now, to some of us, this may seem bizarre, but actually it's a perfectly logical thing to do in our political culture. The next logical step is to donate his entire salary, presumably, and after that to actually start paying constituents for the privilege of representing them. <laughs> Take a look at the list of parliamentary questions circulated in the Dáil every day and see how many are in pursuit of con constituency representations. Let me do it for you. In health, it's roughly about two-thirds of all the parliamentary questions. I think this need to serve the constituency distorts the operation of the political and legislative system. The greatest perk for a minister is not the car or the use of the government jet, it's the office staffed with civil servants to look after the constituency. Now, we should be clear. Politicians do this because voters demand it of them. And I don't mean that the politicians who practice this, and they all do, are necessarily corrupt in the criminal sense. It's worse than that, actually. Our system of democratic representation has become corrupted. And I think this hyper-localism is a reflection, maybe, of the, the third type of corruption or brokenness that I see in our system, which is kind of a profound non-seriousness in which real policy debate and the serious business of running a country has been largely absenced from our political discourse. And this has allowed a couple of principles to emerge as the cornerstones of our political system. One is the national interest is just the sum of all the vocal special interest groups. The second is that nobody should be, insofar as is possible, nobody should really be inconvenienced by anything. And the third is that nobody should be held responsible for anything. So this worldview, I think, has meant that our system has become corrupted, but in a difficult and kind of more damaging way than being under the sway of donors, uh, financial donors to parties. In our system, everyone can push their demands, and nobody says no. It's a system in which there is no benefit for a politician in standing up to an interest group and saying no. Look at the pre-crash decade, or the years of the boom. Every element of our policy debate, practically, was about ratcheting ourselves into trouble. More spending, less tax, and never mind the debt in the private sector, was not a marginal position in the pre-crisis decade. It was the dominant position. Yes, the governments of Bertie Ahern were reckless and short-termists, but I'm not sure it was political donations that made this the case. It was fundamentally because they promised people what they wanted and then they delivered it. You can get, it, get away with this in Ireland because we have a political system which is happy to leave lots of politics and lots of the, op, the governance to, to other people. Our system hasn't developed or even sought to develop basic expertise in relation to the financial system. So in this situation, maybe it's no wonder that the central bank was complacent and we had a situation in 2008 running to the bank guarantee where politicians were ordering up briefing notes to explain basic financial terms. When the banking guarantee was adopted, there's not even the merest hint in the debates of a political system which really understood what was going on. I could do anything but blindly choose between proposals presented by others. 
And I think this lack of respect for informed debate and genuine expertise is a central part of the corruption or the brokenness of Irish politics. Because Irish politics barely does policy debate, it spends its time fighting over the spoils of office and arguing over the processes. In a short essay at the start of the first of the How Ireland Voted series, Tom Garvin described Irish politics as a long game of ideological beggar my neighbour. To him, the only debate appeared to be about who was purest or most determined in pushing the same things. On a similar note, it's two years since I've spoken here, and on the last occasion I did, in July 2010, I had the honour of sharing the platform with the much-missed Peter Mayer. I didn't mind that his arguments were more elegantly constructed than mine, though I thought it was a bit much, his jokes were funnier. But he made one point that struck with me. Whose fault is it, he asked, that our politics is like this? And he answered it, it's our fault. In the discussion that followed, there were contributions, as you would expect, from Garrett Fitzgerald. And Garrett warned that the impetus for political reform would not survive the, what was then the expected new government's first year. If they don't do it in the first year, he warned, they wouldn't do it. I rather fear that both of these greatly missed students of Irish politics were right. Despite his huge and manifest failure, the chances of really changing our politics, our political systems, and crucially the political culture from which they sprung, I think are pretty remote. I see little evidence of the desire to do that among the old politicians, and really not much more from the voters. Thank you.